it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. I'm a subcontractor for an agency that fights monsters. The Second Mission by Akib Ali, 1993. Part One. I was at home enjoying some nice time off with the wife and kids. We were watching a chilling horror movie, munching on some popcorn, when out of nowhere my phone rang, interrupting movie time. I passed the bowl to my wife and gave her a wink after seeing the name that popped up. Mysterious British guy. I showed her the screen. She frowned, gave me the death stare before peering deep into my puppy dog eyes. Finally, after a moment, she gave me the approval with a nod. Oh, thank God, I thought. Hopefully he's got some more work for me. I'd nearly burnt through the entire 50 grand I was paid for the previous mission. I was excited to finally get a chance to kill more monsters and creatures. Well, I'm telling you guys and girls, it's a buzz like no other. So, without further delay, I made my way to the conservatory, closing the door behind me, swiping my finger across the screen. Hello, I answered. After a while of silence, he spoke. Mr. McCarty, how are you doing? He asked in that posh accent of his. Ah, not bad. You know how it is when you're sitting at home playing video games with the children all the time, I replied. The past few months relaxing at home had gotten kind of boring. Well, uh, money's getting a bit tight. Got any more work for me? I asked, releasing a bit of popcorn that was stuck between my teeth with my tongue. Ah, you know me, I only call when it's something important. You'll be happy to know we have another mission that requires your expertise, he answered in a somber tone. So, um, what's the situation? I grinned. I couldn't wait to get my hands dirty again and make some serious money. I've been eyeing up a nice holiday for the family later in the year, but without more money, it would be impossible. Right, I'll just get on with it. In the early hours of the morning, I received a call from an old friend of yours, Colonel Hansen. He explained a situation that has developed in the Middle East. A group of archaeologists discovered an ancient burial mound near an old cave system deep in the Arabian Desert. They went in to explore and have been absent for over a week. The government of Oman has requested assistance from the SDF, who can't spare any people at the moment unless something serious is discovered, he explained. Although the Middle East is primarily comprised of what seems like an endless desert, there's much we don't know about what's underneath all that sand. It could be as simple as the archaeologists got lost in the caverns and can't find their way back to the entrance. Or maybe they touched something they weren't supposed to and awakened something far worse. Something that was left there to be kept away from the rest of the world. Yeah, it's understandable they have bigger fish to fry. You realize this could be bigger than just four people going missing, though, I explained. Yes, but we won't know until the area has been investigated, he replied. And he was right. There was no way of knowing without boots on the ground. All right, I agreed, before asking. What exactly is the pay going to be like? Again, I won't know the exact figure until the job is done. Depends on how serious the situation is and how much effort is put in. My bet is the Yamani government don't want this to get out. Four dead archaeologists on their turf is going to be an international scandal, to say the least. So discretion is advised, and please don't speak to anyone else about this unless it's to someone who has prior knowledge of the mission. He paused for a moment. Are you in or what? <laughs> Give me a few hours to get my shit together before you send your fancy dad to Uber. I chuckled. You've got two hours. The fancy lad's Uber won't wait around. Anyway, I need to sort a few things out so I'll talk to you once you get here. He finished, and then the line went dead. Yes, I cheered under my breath. Finally, I landed myself another job. I wasted no time and got ready before the blacked-out SUV reversed onto my driveway. I kissed and hugged my wife and kids goodbye before entering the car. Nearly two hours later, we arrived at that same old farmhouse as before, right in the middle of nowhere. I thanked the driver, who wished me good luck on the mission, before I grabbed my things and made my way to the entrance of the house. Jessica, Brian, and Carl sat around the table, along with the British guy. They all stood up to greet me. Luckily, Jessica had made a full recovery from the injury she'd suffered during the last insane mission. 
Brian and Carl both greeted me with firm handshakes and expressed their enthusiasm for working with me again. But the honour was completely mine. Even though we were a ragtag band, this little team of ours was capable of doing some great things. Now that you've all had your little romance, I think it's time to get down to business. The British guy interrupted, motioning us to all sit down. You've got one hour to get into your battle suits and prepare your weapons. We're under a lot of pressure right now to get this done in a timely fashion. McCarty, we will once again run point on the mission. Remember, I'll be here as your guide and, and make sure to keep me informed. I'm hoping this is a simple extraction, but all do you know that things can go sideways at any moment. We're on a bit of a tight schedule, so you better get going. He finished, before leaving the table for his desk. We all made our way to the armory and caught up while strapping into our new and improved battle suits that had been updated with better technology since we'd last used them, reducing the weight. It felt a lot easier to move around, and the helmets covered the entire head, unlike the previous versions. The suits snugly connected to our wrist-mounted PDAs, which had also been installed with new software to control the advanced features of the suit. We didn't exactly have the time to mess around with the suit, so I guess it was going to be on-the-job training. I picked up my SCAR battle rifle, my M1911 pistol, along with as much ammunition and supplies as my rucksack could handle. The familiar sound of an MV-22 Osprey began to hum in the distance. We got on board once it landed and made our way to our destination. Well, fast forward 18 hours later, and a very sore bottom, we'd arrived. The Osprey hovered a foot above the sandy terrain to allow us to jump off with our belongings before leaving us ankle-deep in the unstable sand. Can everyone hear me? I asked, testing to see if the comms worked. Loud and clear, Jessica replied with a nod, whilst Carl and Brian both gave me the thumbs up. All right, look over there. I pointed out a group of tents where the excavation team must have made camp. The teams don't usually camp so far away from the dig sites, in my experience. My bet is that there's someone there that can guide us to the right location. The camp was rather empty except for a few men who'd stay behind in case the explorers made it out. The leader spoke some English and agreed to take us to the dig site for a small price. We explained to the man that we didn't carry any money, but he settled for a silver bullet, which held some monetary value at least, rather than a tool used to kill creatures. So, without further delay, we were taken to the entrance of the cave, and instructions of where the mound was discovered. Old tools and excavation equipment littered the area, along with all sorts of supplies. As we moved into the cavern, the darkness began to consume us. I switched the suit on. The LED light strips illuminated the area around us, and a small heads-up display appeared in the visor. A small map appeared in the bottom right corner. The further we moved, the more it filled in. On the left, information on my vitals. It was like something out of a futuristic science fiction movie. The cave led us to a small crack at the front of the cavern wall. We'd been told the archaeologists had gone through where a prehistoric burial mound had been discovered. However, the second time they'd entered, no one returned. We all took in a few deep breaths and readied our weapons before taking our first steps through the mouth of this unknown structure. Footprints in the sand led us about half a mile into the dark depths of these ancient caves, where the remains of a sandstone temple presented itself. A doorway atop a stairway, surrounded by two gigantic pillars on either side, that held the giant stone ceiling above. What the hell is that? Brian asked, crouching down with his weapon pointed at the entrance. Hmm, looks like a temple of some sorts. Normally burial mounds are not as fancy as this, I replied, admiring the architecture. This was one of the strangest things I'd ever seen, but then again the Middle East was not my go-to. What's a temple doing this far deep in a cave system? Carl asked while looking around. Well, the only way to find out is to go through there, I said, pointing at the entrance. Once we were inside, we searched the main chamber, and Brian discovered a trail of dry blood. Guys, go and look at this. He called us over and we followed it to the remains of a shriveled up body. What the fuck happened there? Carl asked, taking a closer look at the remains. I examined the body. Deep claw marks ran across the torso and gashes across what was left of the arms and legs. 
A giant bite mark ran across the entirety of the neck and shoulders, which was rather peculiar. Mm, the telltale signs point to a vampire, but this is unlike any I've seen before. Mm, first of all, the bite marks are larger than an average human's head. Second, they don't normally play with their food. This body has been mutilated for fun. What do you suggest we do? Jessica asked, moving away from the body, when all of a sudden a loud screech emanated from deeper within the belly of the temple. We all turned to face the sound, and there it stood. At well over eight feet tall, large claws on either side. It moved closer into the light, when I noticed its black tar-like skin, along with a giant mouth filled with razor-sharp teeth that almost resembled the mouth of a shark, except this was much more sinister. We let loose a hail of bullets which bounced off its skin like rubber. Even headshots were completely useless. Hey, I thought you were the expert. How come Silver's not working? Carl asked, taking a few steps back. Listen, guys. We need to get the fuck out of here. This is something really fucked up. What we have might not work, I shouted, before we covered each other and took some steps back. The adrenaline was flowing through my body like it was about to pop out of my veins, and the hairs upon my neck began to tingle. I had never faced such a creature ever before. The creature inched closer to us when an idea popped into my head. Switch to incendiary rounds and aim for the mouth, I shouted, switching my magazine over. I turned around to face the creature who was a mere foot away from me and gave it a mouth full of fire. It stopped in its tracks and shrieked in pain for a moment before letting out an angry growl. Oh, I think that just pissed it off even more, Jessica shouted, blasting a fifty caliber sniper round which dug deep into its tar-like skin. Move out of my way, Brian shouted, barraging the monster in a storm of dragonfire rounds from his AA-12 shotgun, which resulted in the creature setting on fire and running back into the depths of the tomb. We all dropped to the ground and caught our breath. Luckily, none of us had suffered any major injuries. We sent out a transmission back to the British guy detailing the events that had taken place. But we still had the mission to complete, which meant running back into that creature again. We switched our suits into stealth mode. All the LEDs were turned off, and activated a night vision in the visors. The quality was not that great, but still enough for us to see before we delved deeper into the heart of the structure. We paced down the chasm, weapons drawn and ready to fire if a threat presented itself. The small map displayed in our visors scanned and recorded the layout of the cave to exceptional accuracy to my surprise. Technology has gone a long way since I began my journey hunting monsters with the SDF. We made our way back to the body that we'd found earlier to double check for anything we could have missed before when we were ambushed by that thing. Look over here! Carl pointed towards a set of prints that led further into the bowels of this ancient temple. These lead further down. I say we follow them and see where they take us. Hopefully we can find the others and get the hell out of here. Oh, let's hope you're right, I replied, taking a look at my wrist-mounted PDA before dropping a marker upon the face of the map and naming it Dead Body 1. The others stared at me with a look as if I'd done something wrong. Well, I know that may sound harsh, but we didn't exactly find a name connecting us to the body. I shrugged before I led the way, following the footprints. McCarthy? What the fuck was that thing? You're supposed to be like the proper professional monster hunter out of all of us, Brian asked, covering our backs as we followed the path. Look, I know just as much as the rest of you. This desert is uninhabited for the most part, and has been left untouched since our history began. At first my wild guess was that we were going to be facing a vampire, but I was proven wrong when that thing first appeared. I'm sure it sucks your blood until you're bone dry, but it also nibbles on your flesh. Vampires don't do all you can eat human buffet, especially flesh that belongs to a dead person. It's poisonous to them. Oh, my next guess was a ghoul, but they have a small stature. I mean, did you see the size of that thing? Big as a fucking tank. Now, I'm not the expert in the Middle Eastern monster hunting scene, but I do know someone who is. Now that we've confirmed this is some kind of monster that's killed some or all of these coffin pokers, 
The SDF will now send that expert ranger tailored for this specific job. Till then, let's do some poking around of our own, find out as much as we can before they get here. I stopped talking, when all of a sudden another path forked off to the side. I looked below and saw the dusty ground had recently been agitated. Hey, over here. Let's see where this one leads. Part 2 A smaller, more protected chamber revealed itself to us, where a makeshift campfire had been pieced together from what looked like broken pieces of sandstone and fed with scraps of paper. What stood out the most was the various pieces of abandoned equipment that littered the room. What was the point of bringing all this equipment if you was just going to leave it lying around? Carl stated, going through some of the stuff. Well, I don't blame them, especially with that thing running around. You're not exactly going to carry all this shit when your life is on the line, Jessica stated, taking a seat near what looked like a rucksack. Hey, look what I found. What is it? I asked, moving closer to her to get a better view. It looks like a diary of some sorts, she replied opening the cover to investigate. Well, I might as well read it, seeing as it's in my hands now. Diary Entry 1 I'm writing this diary to record our findings at the excavation site situated deep in the Arabian Desert. The government of Oman had initially hired me to search the deserted dunes of the Arabian Desert for well, underwater reservoirs to help the local agricultural industry. After two weeks of trudging through soft sand with my team, we stumbled upon the entrance of the initial cave. We called the government and requested their support to excavate the site. Within a few days, multiple teams of diggers had arrived with their shovels and begun to unearth the entrance of this cave. It wasn't long until it was safe enough for us to explore. Now, please note the names of everyone involved have been redacted at the request of the government of Omar. Diary Entry 2 one of the men working on the team discovered a fissure in the wall of the cave leading to a bigger structure. The other members of the dig team began to argue over the nature of the structure. They concluded that this structure was home to some sort of creatures who go by the name of Jin. Well, that's all just superstitious nonsense that these people have come up with over the years to dissuade people from exploring these lands in search of resources. I managed to contact a team of British archaeologists stationed at the University of Cairo in Egypt were willing to take the lead exploring the hidden caves under the non-disclosure agreement set out by the government of Oman. They agreed to fly over as soon as possible. Diary Entry 3 The archaeology team have arrived with all their fancy equipment and taken the lead on how to approach the expedition. Most of the dig team have left us, too convoluted in their superstitious tales of the supposed demons that live in these lonely caves. At least these archaeologists are of sound mind and can't wait to be the first people to explore the cold bosom of these prehistoric ruins. After a while, we discovered a structure of some sort. So upon closer inspection of the architecture, it was noted by one of the older members of the team that the construction dated further back in time than the ancient pyramids of Giza. I wonder what secrets this place holds for us to all unravel. After a short safety inspection by the team, we were cleared to enter the belly of this beast. Diary Entry 4 the Archaeologists are confused. The doorway led us through a main chamber, then down an endless path of caves leading to absolutely nowhere by the looks of it. Why was it built here? Why do these people dig a massive tunnel that seems to go on forever? These questions still have to be answered. Surely there's more to this place than what meets the eye. Diary Entry 5 Ah, jackpot. We just hit an absolute gold mine of history with what we just discovered. This is going to shake the entire archaeological world. Once we arrived at the end of the tunnel, we noticed the cave had somewhat collapsed upon itself. After a few hours of carefully clearing the debris, it opened up to a massive chamber, large enough to fit an entire town within. The remains of what looked like bipedal humanoid creatures littered the area, almost perfectly preserved in the closed time capsule of the ruins. Hmm. Could this be another human ancestor? Or are these humanoids from a completely different genome? Diary Entry 6 Oh, damn it. 
I believe we've discovered something far more sinister here. One of the archaeologists got a bit too close to an object that resembled an egg of some sort. He cracked it open only to discover a perfectly preserved insect the size of a dog. Before anyone could take a closer look at the creature, it leaped forward at the man inspecting it and stabbed him with its spear-like tail right in the belly button. The man shrieked and screamed in pain as the creature deposited some kind of object from itself through its tail like a tube and into the man. The other members managed to yank it off and kill it with a stone. Without a proper medical professional here, I believe he may die soon. We should have just left this place when we noticed the bodies and called for a bigger team to survey the finds. Demotivated, we're now heading back the way we came. Diary Entry 7 I can't believe what I've just witnessed. The archaeologist who'd been attacked by that creature died a few hours ago. His wounds seemed to be stable with no further blood loss after one of the others managed to create a makeshift fire from bits of stone and whatever fuel we could find in our backpacks. He heated a small bowie knife and closed the wound. It made no sense, but we covered his body to calm our nerves. A while later we returned, only to discover the body had disappeared, leaving only a trail of liquid as black and thick as tar. What's more strange are these ghastly noises reverberating around the cold walls of this hellish tomb. What on earth is going on here? Diary Entry 8 We're all going to die here. It's coming for us. If anyone finds this pli- And that's where it ends, Jessica stated, passing me the diary to inspect. Ah, well, looks like we stumbled on some kind of Prometheus-level shit here, Brian replied as he readied his weapon. I took images of the entries and sent them to HQ, along with a message to send for more help. I just hope it got where it needed and backup was coming. Right, we're going to rest up here for a moment, then head down that long-ass tunnel and see what the hell's going on down there. Hopefully by then some reinforcements arrive. I don't like the sound of them diary entries one bit. The others nodded in agreement, and we sat down and rested our tired bodies. Brian took the first watch, as the rest of us got some much-needed shutter. A few hours had passed, and we'd rested up rather nicely. I'd switched places with Brian halfway, to give him some rest, as it would have been unfair to let him take the full burden of watching us whilst the rest of us got some shutter. Before making our way deeper down the long and narrow bowels of this demented cave, we loaded our magazines to the brim with as much incendiary ammunition as we'd brought along. Fire was the only thing that seemed to affect that godforsaken creature. The walk down the main chasm took what seemed like hours, even more so after reading them diary entries. With every step we inched closer to what could potentially lead to our deaths, Brian and Carl stayed silent as they covered our backs whilst Jessica and I walked side by side through the dusty darkness. We reminisced on the previous missions we'd worked on in our younger days, whilst I was a ranger in the SDM. Some of the things we did back in the day were so bizarre you could say it was completely made up. Well, soon enough the main chamber presented itself to us, and we all readied ourselves to confront the unknown. The ghastly sight of decomposing corpses greeted us along with a foul stench that upset our bellies to the core. Well, I guess these are the bodies those stupid archaeologists found, Jessica stated, kneeling down to inspect the closest one before quickly moving back. Is it me or does it smell really bad in here? I nodded in agreement. Yeah, not exactly the nicest of smells, I answered, before turning to the others. Carl... I need you to guard the exit road. Make sure nothing gets past that point. Brian, your job is to rig this place up for the 4th of July in case shit hits the fan like it did last time. We can't risk anything other than ourselves getting out of here alive. Me and Jessica will poke around and see if we can do some detective work and figure out what exactly occurred here. I tapped a button on my wrist-mounted PDA to begin a video log from the camera mounted on my helmet as Brian and Carl got to work on their tasks. I turned to face Jessica. You ready? Hell yeah. I can't wait, she replied sarcastically before adding, Oh, you lead the way and I'll follow. 
I decided to first take a closer look at these humanoid beings that had been butchered. Their limbs had been gnawed at and chewed into mincemeat similar to the body we'd found earlier. Their blood also appeared to be sucked dry. From the ones that were not as damaged, I deduced that their heads were slightly larger and more elongated compared to humans, and their limbs would have been longer and more slender. They probably stood a few heads taller, and from what remained of their clothing, it appeared to be made out of a synthetic material of some sort. Jessica pointed out something unusual that appeared to be present in all the bodies. Large puncture wounds in the groin, large enough for a fox to burrow in. The marks on the ground near the wound suggested it was caused by something coming out, and not an entry wound. Bran was right. This does look like something out of an alien movie. Except these creatures don't burst out of your chest, but rather your belly, Jessica scoffed. The disgusting thought of these monsters planting an embryo in our bodies before killing us in a bloody explosion for their own birth sent trembling shivers down both our spines. We both took a step back to take a breather and calm our nerves. Well, I sure hope these battle suits are sturdy enough to stop them from planting that shit inside of us, in case we get jumped. I was cut off by the crackle of the radio communicator. McCarthy? Did you copy? Brian called out. Uh, this is McCarthy. I hear you loud and clear. What's going on? I replied. The explosives have been planted and ready to detonate on your command. I've regrouped with Carl and we're awaiting further orders. How's your investigation going? Brian asked. Uh, could be better, I guess. I'll fill you in on the details later. Guard that entrance no matter what. We cannot afford to let even one of those things escape. Did you copy? Understood. Over and out. Brian finished, before the line went dead and the channel with Jessica returned, who stood observing something in the distance. Hey, uh, what is it? I asked. I'd seen that look many times in the past. Whenever she noticed something, she always had that look about her. Over there! She pointed towards a small gap in the wall of the cavern. What is it? I asked, taking a few steps forward. Everything looked normal to me except for a slight blur in my night vision overlay. Well, it looks a bit blurred to me, that's it. Switch off your night vision, you clown. You'll see what I mean, she explained. I switched it off, and that's when I noticed a faint blue glow escaping through the gap. It would have been impossible to spot whilst in night vision mode. Luckily for me, Jessica had always had a knack for noticing these kinds of things. What do you think it could be? She asked, following my back as I moved closer to the unusual light with my weapon drawn. Ah, oh, there's only one way to find out, I replied, inching closer to the gap like a ninja trying not to attract any unwanted attention. Once I was near enough, I motioned to Jessica that I was going to jump through the gap. I gave her a three-finger countdown before rushing the opening with my weapon drawn, ready to pull the trigger at the slightest sight of danger. But what we discovered instead was the surface of what looked like a large metallic structure where a clawed-out hole allowed us to peer inside. A long, damaged corridor presented itself on the other side. Otherworldly objects littered the floor, bits of metal hung from the ceiling along with dots of faint blue light. The construction matched nothing I'd ever seen before. These humanoid creatures we'd found were far more technologically advanced than I'd initially thought they were. Why was it we'd never encountered them before? What other secrets were hidden away in this long-forgotten metal casket? This is very different to what I was expecting to see here, I stated, glancing towards Jessica. If this cave hasn't been touched in thousands of years before these coffin pokers came along, how exactly has this structure stood the test of time? Jessica asked, knocking on the metallic wall. Well, I suspect this metal is made out of a very durable alloy. We should take a sample to take back with us. Even though it's been sealed for that long... I've not heard of a metal that can survive that amount of time unless it's made from pure gold, I explained. Oh, this isn't something you see every day, even in this job, Jessica stated in awe, before picking up the cleanest chunk she could find and slipping it into her backpack. Should we call for backup before we go any further? She added, once ready to proceed. I think it's better if it's only the two of us. It'll be more quiet in case there's more of them things lurking around in here. I stated, 
before looking down at the floor further ahead, where I noticed a trail of viscous, slimy blood mixed with specks of that black tar-like substance, leading further down the shaft. Yeah, take a look at that. Let's follow that trail and see where it leads, hopefully to some answers. Jessica nodded in agreement, before we followed the sinister trail through a few junctions of interconnecting corridors. I made sure the battle suit was recording our path as we transversed the maze. We passed a few bulkhead doors on the way. We tried to open some of them, but all of them had been sealed shut from the looks of them. The more we moved forward, the more the quantity of the slime increased exponentially. We got to a point where the entire surface of the structure was saturated from head to toe. Luckily, our suit prevented the slimy gel from getting in, even though we were kicking ankle deep in the stuff. Overhead, the corridor stopped where a larger bulkhead was stuck or broken halfway. There was enough space for the two of us to squeeze through, though. Once on the other side, we quickly discovered the room was filled to the brim with large eggs, each one the size of a cat. Oh, this is not good, Jessica said in a somber tone, shining her flashlight across the room to assess the quantity of how fucked we were. Don't make any sudden moves. We don't want to trigger the end of the goddamn world, I ordered, making a complete halt. This is a lot worse than I imagined. We cannot risk even one of these things getting out, let alone an army. We should warn the others, I stated. But just as I was about to tap the screen to open a channel, a loud snarl erupted from behind us. The sound of claws scratching through metal shortly followed. I turned around with my weapon drawn before one of them let loose a deafening screech. Three towering tanks of tar emerged from behind the broken bulkhead. They clawed at the door like blood-hungry rats, hell-bent on making us their next meal, and with every hit, they were getting closer to their objective. Adrenaline raced through my veins and my arms became tense. I noticed movement from within the eggs as the shells began to crack. The small devils from within had broken free from their slumber and made this situation a whole lot worse. I wasn't exactly sure how we were going to get out of this one, surrounded on all sides with nowhere to go. We had no choice but to stay and fight our way out or face certain death or potential impregnation. At the corner of my eye I noticed a closed door at the other side of the room, where a right-angled corner looked like the perfect place to mount our defence. Run over there and give them hell. You concentrate on the smaller ones. I've got a little surprise for these big fuckers, I shouted, pointing the way. Jessica switched to her sidearm, a nice compact Glock 19 pistol, and set it to single fire mode before picking the little monstrosities off as they emerged from their cocoons. Meanwhile, I loaded my grenade launcher with a high incendiary round and let it loose towards the bulkhead before a ball of fire erupted from one of the creature's chests. The large explosion shook the ground and tore the creature into many pieces, whilst the others were not back during the frenzy. The unstable ceiling collapsed in front of the door, barring the others from entry for the moment. Ignoring the projectiles from the ceiling, I aimed my battle rifle at what was left of the smaller bastards and sprayed them with as many bullets as I could. But there were far too many of them in number. It wasn't long until they had us surrounded, inching closer with every second. For fuck's sake, we're going to die in here, Jessica screamed, reloading another magazine while I covered her. My clip also ran dry, and it would have taken too long to reload, so I quickly switched to my pistol as fast as I could and picked the closer ones off. All of a sudden, a bright blue light appeared from atop the door near us. A moment later, it shot open. Oh, over there, Jessica. Go through it now, then cover me once you're through. With all her might, Jessica barrel-rolled through the door, landing in a crouched position as I followed her through. Somehow the door shut as soon as I'd made it through, cutting one of the closer creatures in half. We both fell to the floor to catch our breath. What on earth just happened? Jessica exhaled. I rested my head upon the floor. Well, that was a fucking close one. Part 3 We composed ourselves and caught our breath for a moment in some much-needed silence. 
The rattling and tapping from the swarm of those vile belly busters slowly faded away. Jessica and I found ourselves at the end of another corridor that led into darkness. Lights in this section must have succumbed to the passage of time. We both decided not to risk the restricted view from the night vision mode, and instead used the LEDs to light up. About twenty meters ahead of us, at the other end, another door stared back at us. A blue light illuminated above its head, as if to say, Come here. We need to move from here. Those things won't rest until they get to us. Don't know about you, but I sure as hell don't trust the integrity of this place to feel safe enough just sitting around here. There's clearly someone else here who just saved our necks, and judging from the way the light above that door illuminated, that's where they want us to go next. I explained, breaking the silence. Do you think it could be one of those archaeologists holding out somewhere in here? Jessica asked, taking a look at the scraps of ammunition she had left. Don't exactly have much ammo left. She showed me three magazines of handgun and half that for her rifle. We can't say for certain until we go further. Besides, I bet you're glad you left that sniper rifle at home. I grinned before looking at the scraps I had left. I don't exactly have much ammo myself. Let's see if I can get some sort of signal in here to contact the others. I tapped the screen on my PDA to open a channel to the others. Uh, this is McCarthy. Brian, Carl, do you copy? Over. A moment passed before a crackled voice penetrated the silence. This is Brian. McCarthy, I hear you loud and clear, although there's a bit of noise in the background. Watch your sit rep. We heard a whole lot of commotion. Yeah, we got ourselves into a little bit of a pickle. Keep your eyes peeled. There's a metric shit ton of them little fuckers crawling around. Maybe one or two of the big ones. We're kind of stuck inside a strange structure. But we're trying to get out of here. Affirmative. Do you want us to come help? Over. Carl interrupted. Negative. Just guard that entrance. Like I said, this situation is getting more out of control the more we investigate. Me and Jessica will find a way out of this. We think one of them archaeologists might have survived and is holding out in the control room. Over. I ordered. There was no reason for them to put themselves at further risk, especially with that swarm lurking around. Brian and Carl both agreed before the channel went dead. We took in an astronomical breath each before inching closer to the other end. I took point and Jessica had my back as we approached the door. We didn't know exactly what to expect from this damn place. We were both tired and succumbing to the trauma of this mission. I just wanted to get it all over and done with so I could get back home and have a nice warm shower to wash away the blood, sweat and tears of this shit show. The bulkhead instantly swung open like one of those automatic doors you see at the shopping malls to an area that looked like another large chamber. I gave Jessica a quick glance before we both made our way in. One by one the lights in the room flickered back to life revealing a plethora of metallic terminals and chairs overlooking a large screen that looked across the rocky surface of the cave. Hmm, wasn't like anyone's home, I stated, turning to face Jessica. She tapped me on the shoulder and silently motioned for me to look towards the far end of the room. We both stared down the scopes of our rifles and aimed the red dots of our scopes at the bizarre sight. A grey metallic sphere levitated above a strange white aura, hiding behind one of the terminals. It hesitantly moved to the side to reveal something that resembled an arsenal of cameras and sensors, similar to the new smartphones that contained multiple cameras. A blue light rhythmically flashed as it slowly inched closer to us, as if it was afraid. Don't move, Jessica shouted, releasing the safety on her rifle. The sphere responded by flinching back, and the blue light began to beat faster as it hid itself further. Jessica, put your weapon down. I don't think this thing is a threat, I ordered, before relaxing my weapon and slowly moving closer with my arms up. I mean, if it had wanted to cause us harm, it would have done that by now. Easy now. Look, I'm not going to hurt you. The sphere peeked out again from behind the console, and once it thought it realized we weren't a threat, it began to move out again and came closer to me until it levitated a meter from me at head height. One of the instruments from its cluster opened and four laser beams scanned me from head to toe. I felt a strange reverberation throughout my entire body 
as the hairs going down my neck stiffened. The beams moved closer to my PDA just as the lights on my suit began to flicker before powering down. What the fuck is going on? Jessica asked, clutching the grip of her rifle, ready to fire in case shit hit the fan. I knew she was just as freaked out as I was. Well, he just scanned me. Now it's fucking around with my suit, I replied, when all of a sudden my suit powered up once again. I sighed in relief, just as an unknown channel opened within my communication app. Uh, hello? I called out in confusion. The sphere moved back to head height. Who are you? A neutral voice asked. Wait a second, are you talking to me through my comms? I asked. Yes, that is correct. I am what you people refer to as an artificial intelligence. I scanned your electronic device and learned your language along with how to communicate with you. I'm sorry for the inconvenience as I had to reset your suit in order to boot the changes to your device, the sphere explained. Oh, awesome. Well, now that explains why I'm powered down. Well, glad you found a way for us to communicate. So, we were sent here to investigate the disappearance of some of our people who would stumble upon some of your nasty friends. I assure you they are not my friends. They were created by the enemies of the people that created me. This ship was carrying these creatures as prisoners. We were ambushed just as we neared your solar system and crash-landed here approximately 134,376 years, 244 days, 7 hours and 56 seconds ago. My creators are now all dead due to the efforts of one of these creatures who had escaped during the ambush. My creators all lie dead within the cave and were used as incubators to reproduce more creatures. Hmm. I understand. That's a whole lot of time you spent down here on your own. How did you survive all that time? This ship is made from an alloy that can withstand the test of time. My exoskeleton is made from the exact same material. Besides, I was in hibernation mode for most of that time, until a week ago when my proximity sensors had been activated. The ship's power core will not last much longer. Once that occurs, it won't be long until the other creatures are released from their slumber. Hold on a second there. So you're telling me there's more of them creatures on this ship? Affirmative. Some are far worse than the creatures you've already faced. I turned to face Jessica, who looked just as stunned as I did. Either we were tripping balls on some kind of weird cave fungus, or we actually just stumbled upon some space beef that's been broiling for millions of years. Well, my head hurt, and this entire mission just kept on surprising the hell out of both of us. I could tell by Jessica's face that she wanted to get home and forget this had ever happened. I faced the sphere. So... Uh, how do we go about preventing them other creatures from escaping? If you take me to the engine room, I can force the engine into a feedback loop and self-destruct with what little power it has left. Well, um, how big of an explosion are we talking? As long as it's not Death Star level destruction, I think it's a good idea. There's over 7 billion people living on this planet, so I kind of have to make sure. I explained, raising my eyebrows. Do not worry. There will be enough energy collected in the shield capacitors during the feedback loop to create a barrier seconds before the explosion to take the brunt of the explosion. Alright. What about you? I asked. Surely the sphere had a plan on what it was going to do after the blast. My mission will be complete. There will be no further use to me. I will die in the explosion. Now look here. I'm not going to let you kill yourself. Maybe you can help us take care of some monsters of our own. We're plagued by creatures like this all the time. You probably already know, seeing as though you've scanned my PDA. Help us save lives here on Earth. Maybe at some point we can get you back to your creators. The sphere took a moment to think about its decision, before giving us its answer. I agree to your terms. The sphere then moved back, when all of a sudden a siren began to sound. The light switched from blue to red, and the flashing blue light on the sphere began to race faster than my heartbeat. Something strange was happening within the ship. One of my sensors has tripped in the prisoner holding chamber. 
Those creatures are moving towards the control unit for the cryogenic chambers where the prisoners are kept. If they destroy the relays before this ship explodes, our mission will have been for nothing. Oh, damn it. Tell us where we need to go. I shouted when the small map displayed in my visor began to populate the unknown areas of the ship, and the fastest route to our destination had been outlined. Ah, that's what I'm talking about. Right, get behind us, I finished, before we readied our weapons and marched forward. We navigated the maze of corridors to the engine room, where a giant column cut through the center. On both sides stood terminals obviously connected to the structure via a web of illuminated fiber optic cables. The sphere moved to the closest one and began to transmit data back and forth. About five minutes later, it was done. The feedback loop had been initiated and the capacitors had been set to charge energy until a few seconds before the explosion. According to the sphere, the resulting explosion would have just been felt on the outside as a minor earthquake. Luckily for us, there was hardly anyone living in this part of the desert. I was about to ask what was the quickest way out of here when all of a sudden the sphere turned around and the LED upon its face began to flash faster again. It turned and connected to the terminal once more. What's going on? I asked. The surviving creatures are currently trying to destroy the cryogenic relay that is keeping the prisoners at bay. We must prevent that from occurring or else our plan would have been for nothing. The sphere warned us before marking the quickest way to the cryogenic relay on the map. As soon as we arrived, I noticed a swarm of belly busters gnawing and clawing at the metal wall where I assumed the relay was situated. From the damage I could see on the wall, I guessed it was only a matter of moments before the wall caved in and exposed the heart of the relay. Jessica moved to my side before we both aimed our rifles at the swarm, before letting loose a volley of well-placed shots. As soon as the first shot was fired, a small group of the creatures broke off from the main body and concentrated their efforts on derailing our mission. Their effort was futile, as we took them out with ease. It all seemed to go well. <laughs> That is until one of the large metal grates from the ceiling came crashing down, nearly knocking the both of us out cold. Countless years of training for situations like this kept us alive as we barely managed to dodge it. Adrenaline raced throughout my body and just as we were about to begin firing again, a loud screech emerged from the darkness of the vent above. One of the big ones jumped out and landed between the two of us. Deep wounds scattered along its body where the grenade I'd let loose earlier had sliced its tarry skin. The creature swung its razor-sharp claws at Jessica, who leaped back and hit the wall of the corridor. I finally got an opening that was safe enough and fired a few shots into its head, which caused it to shift its attention to me for a moment. This gave Jessica a moment to move away and come stand next to me. I'm running out of ammo. You're probably in the same boat, I shouted. What do you suggest? Jessica replied, providing some covering fire as we backed up. There's no way we can fight the big guy and the little ones at the same time. We need to fall back and regroup with the others. On my mark, we run. I loaded a grenade into the launcher and pressed the trigger. It impacted the ceiling and exploded. The metal grates upon the ceiling rained down upon the smaller creatures, squashing them like pancakes. Whilst another grate hit the larger creature in the head, knocking it to the floor. That was our chance to escape. Now, let's get out of here, I screamed, before we legged it out of there. Part 4 We darted through the corridors as fast as we could. At this point my legs felt sore and my back hurt like hell, getting worse with every step I took. The mission had taken its toll on us with no expenses spared. Jessica somewhat limped on with her leg slightly slumped. Well, I know that stubborn woman all too well to know that she'd carry on without saying anything when hurt like she did the last time on the previous mission. As we reached the punctured hull of the ship, the sphere suddenly stopped. I wouldn't have noticed if it didn't turn to check if the creatures had caught up to us. It spun around and stared down the empty corridor. Jessica leaped out before turning to see why I'd stopped. What's going on? Why have you stopped? She asked, clutching her rifle tighter in her hands. No idea. Just get the others. I'll sort it out. I replied, taking a few steps back. Hey, Sphere, come on. They're on our tail. I exclaimed, taking a few steps towards it. 
I sure as hell didn't want those things catching up on us. I didn't have enough energy at that point to lone wolf a battle. They've destroyed the relay. It's no use. They will escape before the ship will self-destruct, it explained. Come on, we need to regroup with the others to mount a proper defense. If they get to us here, we'll both die. At least with the others, we have the slither of a chance to survive. The cave has been rigged with explosives. We'll blow this place to smithereens before we allow them monsters to escape. I'd really hoped my pleading was going to do the trick. I was really hoping we could use the sphere to make a difference in the war against these monsters that roam freely above ground. The light on its instrument cluster flashed for a moment as it calculated its response. Then it turned back to face me an inch closer. It sort of gave me a nod of approval. It must have learned that from interactions between me and Jessica. The sounds of metal clanking approached in the distance, and figures began to emerge from the far end of the corridor. I turned and hightailed it out of there, remembering to open a channel with the others. Brian, Coral, do you copy? Over, I yelled. We're here. Jessica's sort of running towards us. Over, Brian replied. All right. Please don't shoot the floating sphere thing. We're coming in hot. I We're coming in hot. Get into defensive positions now. Over, I yelled once again, before they came into view. Wait. Oh, never mind. Understood. Over, he finished. Brian and Carl both stood with their rifles a few meters apart. The Sphere and I rushed through the gap when they both ignited a couple of flares each and lobbed them into the center of the cave. They anxiously waited for the onslaught to begin, whilst me and Jessica snatched a few magazines from a pile that had been left for us once we'd arrived. We quickly reloaded and took our place in the center of the gap as the horde began to emerge. The Sphere inched back a few spaces as a storm of growls and screeches emerged from the darkness, shortly followed by their sadistic silhouettes. Incendiary rounds glowed through the air, hitting their marks. Jessica and Carl took care of the little ones whilst Brian and I tore holes in the larger ones, turning them into what I'd like to call swish cheese. However, our efforts were not much effective against the larger, more heavily armoured ones. Our offensive only slowed them down. Brian, how many grenades you got left? I asked, blowing the brains out of one of the creatures. Only got two left. He replied, reloading his rifle. All right, pass me one and load your launcher. On my mark, we shoot the ceiling of the cave over there. I pointed out a spot between the ship and the larger creatures. I caught the grenade and quickly popped it into place. Massive chunks of the ceiling rained down upon the far end of the chamber, enough to incapacitate the large ones who bled out between the rocks. From what I could tell, a large chunk of the ceiling ended up blocking the entrance to the ship. It was a risky move that could have killed us. We were lucky enough to be outside the area that was influenced by the pelting. We finished off what was left of them and took a moment to catch our breaths. Let's get the hell out of here and detonate the explosives. I don't really feel like staying here any longer, Brian pleaded when a large thumping sound emanated from the blanket of rocks near the ship. Oh, it's not over yet. I muttered, as rocks were flung over toward us. A large creature emerged from the wreckage. It easily stood about ten feet tall, its dark, tar-like skin blending in with the darkness. Its arms were huge. Think of the Hulk with arms twice as big. And judging from the body language it gave off, it looked pretty pissed off. The ground shook as it stomped closer. There's no way we could detonate the explosive in time to get out of there, and according to the sphere, we had about 15 minutes before the ship went kaboom. I ordered Brian and Carl to spread wider apart whilst Jessica stayed back. As usual, I moved forward and did my best to distract it whilst trying to stay alive. The creature swung its huge arms at me. Its larger size meant its attacks were slow, but they did pack a punch, leaving giant craters in the ground where it had missed me. I managed to lure it away from the others so they had a clear shot on its back. I was tired, and my sluggishness began to become more prevalent as the number of close encounters began to increase. Damn it. Whilst in the frenzy, I misstepped and twisted my ankle. This was enough of an opportunity for the creature to hit its mark. Well, all I remember from this point was a loud crash, as if I'd been run over by a car. I coughed up a mouthful of blood, which covered my visor. 
I remember opening my eyes to blurred vision. My head rung with a deafening silence, and my head felt so numb that it was like I was floating through space. I would have been dead if it weren't for the armored battlesuit. With what little energy I could muster, I managed to remove the helmet. The others ran and positioned themselves between me and the creature who clearly had a grudge against me. They let loose a hail of bullets, but to no success. Get out of here, I ordered. But they didn't listen and stayed put as the monstrosity inched closer. Get out of here and blow the explosives. Brian moved closer to me and knelt beside me. You'll live. Now stop complaining. I'm only going to blow this place to smithereens as a last resort. He took out a morphine syringe from his medical pack and injected me. I felt so good flowing through my body as it numbed the pain. Shit, there's more of them coming out of the rubble, Carl explained. We're on our last magazine. We need to... He was interrupted by a popping sound, followed by a large explosion in the creature's ugly face. That wasn't one of ours, Brian said, twisting his head towards the entrance of the cave. A female figure emerged dressed in a similar armoured suit as ours, but from what I could see it was way more advanced than the ones me and the team wore. She fired some shots from her rifle as she moved towards us. The ammunition she used pierced the creature's skin, pausing its advance. The lady moved towards me and the others. McCarthy, a familiar voice called out. Only you will get yourself into a situation like this, she said, tossing a pouch full of magazines to the others. Quickly reload your weapons with these, she ordered. Quickly reload your weapons with these, she ordered the others, before moving closer to me and tossing a small test tube filled with a red liquid. Here, drink this. Well, I did as I was bid. A strange feeling erupted within me as my ribs clicked back into place, along with my body's healing process somehow becoming supercharged energy flowed inside me. I stretched my body and got up. Al Hussein, it's been a long time. There's no time to chat. Here, take my rifle. She tossed her rifle and a couple of magazines before reaching for the handles of two short swords mounted upon the lower parts of her leg armor. The blades gleamed orange like molten metal and expunged a fiery aura before she made her way to the large creature. I was sort of out of the loop with the new weapons they developed recently at the SDF, but this shit looked cool as hell, and whatever magic they used in that potion seemed to do the trick fixing me up. I aimed the rifle and ordered my team to take care of the smaller creatures, while Al Hussein engaged in melee combat with the Titan. Who the fuck's that? Brian asked. SDF Ranger Captain Adi Al Hussein, I replied. Well, this was a blast from the past. She'd worked under me whilst I was a ranger myself in the SDF. We'd worked hundreds of missions together before she got stationed in the Middle East. Well, she's better than you, Brian chuckled as he finished off the last of the stragglers. Hey, listen here. I taught her everything she knows. Just ask her, she'll tell you the same, I replied. Arya deflected a blow from the Titan before slicing it a few times in the belly. She was much faster and agile compared to myself and had the advantage of youth on her side. However, the creature was unyielding no matter what she did. She went in for a lunge when the creature grabbed her with both arms and lifted her up. It squeezed her enough that she dropped her signature swords. Right, aim for the joints in his legs. Single fire only, I ordered the team, who fired careful shots as to not hit the ranger. This lessened the creature's grip on Arya, who managed to release her arms from its heinous grip. Arya aimed her arms at its face, where small metal nozzles emerged from a section of her gauntlets and let loose an inferno of fire like a flamethrower. The creature wailed and took a few steps back, dropping her to the ground. Stop firing, I shouted, as I didn't want to take the chance of hitting her. The ranger picked up her swords and lunged forward, digging them deep within the titan's groin, and rolled backwards to avoid the mammoth as it fell upon its knees. She climbed up on its legs and with a quick motion sliced its head clean off and jumped off, placing the swords back into their sheaths before casually walking back. The ground rumbled as the creature smashed into the ground. 
Well, we should think about getting out of here. That ship's going to blow very soon, I shouted. I grabbed the sphere with both arms and dragged it out of the entrance before we all hightailed it as far as possible. Brian flicked the switch on the explosives, sealing the way there under a pile of rubble. We must have sprinted for at least ten minutes when everything started shaking uncontrollably like an earthquake. We managed to make it out of there before the entire cave system collapsed in a sea of dust and sand. According to the airlift that waited above the ground, it looked as though the earth had swallowed up a chunk of the desert. Well, at least it'll get covered up in a day or two. I said, breaking the silence and removing some parts of my battlesuit. I thought you gave up this life, old man, Arya interrupted. What happened to, oh, I want a normal job? And she chuckled. Yeah, that uh, didn't go as planned. You know how it is, I replied. Well, the colonel wants your help with the mission. You'll get a decent wage. You in? She asked. Uh, it depends who's involved and what it entails. You can ask him in person when we land at the al Udaid Air Base. She finished them before turning to face the sphere, who I sort of held in place next to me with my arm. What on earth is that? The sphere turned to face me to hear my reply. Well, this here is, um, sphere. Artificial intelligence of some sort. Well, it's a long story. I'll fill you in later. A few hours later, we landed at the base where U.S. Air Force personnel helped treat our injuries. Afterwards, I was called into a meeting room where the British guy and Ranger Colonel Hansen sat across from each other. Hansen stood up and gave me a hug before we saluted each other. That man had taught me everything I knew about fighting monsters. I spent the next hour explaining the situation and what we'd discovered. Well, the original mission was to find the archaeologist before it got derailed into a nice hot pile of mess. The British guy wasn't too happy about it, but Hansen managed to convince him we could cover it up with the collapse of the cave. Another thing that was discussed was what was going to become of the sphere. The British guy tried his best to keep possession of it as he financed the mission, but the SDF had the ability to pull some rather long strings that would have ended badly for the Brits. It was decided that the sphere would go to a SDF research facility, where it could help with the fight against the other creatures that terrorize the Earth. Well, that's all over. We need to talk, Hansen explained. Yeah, Arya mentioned something about another mission you have for me. Yes, indeed. Colonel Tamaramo is leading a large mission in Japan. He turned to glance at the British guy who still sulked at his defeat over the ownership of the sphere. The contents of which are very classified. I'll fill you in on the details later on. Here, take my phone and speak to your family. He tossed a military-grade mobile phone which had the ability to call anywhere in the world. I walked out of the exit and stood in the corridor while punching in my wife's number. She was really glad to hear my voice again. The kids were really excited, but I had to break the bad news to them about the next mission. We chatted for a while longer before I put the phone down. British guy met me just before he left and wished me good luck on the next mission. He explained that he'd send someone to make sure my wife received my wage for the mission. I had some time to myself that night with the rest of my team in the med bay. They wished me good luck with the next mission and explained they'd be waiting for my return. All right, all right, well, sometimes it is just me not getting around to doing the next episodes, but sometimes I do have to wait patiently on the office to get around to writing a bit more of these series stories. And that's the case of this one. I can't believe it was February 2020 when I read the first episode of this. Those two years have flown by. It didn't feel that long, I can tell you. Anyway, delighted to be able to return to this universe, and uh, hope you enjoyed that episode as much as I did reading it for you. Thoughts, feelings, anything else you want to say in the comment section below the video. And as ever, I'll do my best to reply to as many as I can. Well, it's a pretty good start to the week. Got something nice lined up for you on Wednesday as well. But until then, my dear friends, very, very sweet dreams, and bye-bye. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this story today. 
really means a lot to me and to the author of the story, of course. Well, if you want to know more about me, I'm pretty much everywhere on social media. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can download my music on SoundCloud. Um, I've got a Patreon if you feel like. Throw me a dollar or two. Very much appreciated. And of course, on Reddit, I have a place where you can leave stories if you want me to read one that you've written. Well, hoping to see you all again very soon. Till then, sweet dreams. Bye-bye.